Bernard can put it very pithily, would you rather the lights went out? Yeah. Is there an alternative? And, and Bernard was the person who first put that argument into Mrs. Thatcher's mouth uh, in the 80s, and uh, all that happened was that the escaped. one reactor, not the ten reactors that uh, she promised in order to avoid the lights Actually, going out. Actually, that is quite an interesting point. Why, Mrs. Thatcher wanted ten built, and there was only one built. Well, the lights didn't go out. Um, well, what and happened? Will B was built, and I think that yes. what happened was that we were awash. Uh, coal, uh, uh, oil, oil and Didn't gas was coming out of our ears and it was as cheap as sin. Actually, the really important thing about the energy gap argument is the government's own consultation document says that you can't expect any nuclear electricity to be appearing in Britain before 2021 and that the uh, energy gap will appear if it appears at all around 2016. So it has to explain how it thinks nuclear power Generating electricity in 2021 can help you with well, a uh, well, well, problem it, that appears in 2016. Well, I suppose we might just have four years with intermittent lights going on and <laughs> yeah. off. But I mean, at least that's better than that's better than nothing, isn't it? Uh, it, it, it? It is one of those absolute fear scare arguments that used. No, the lights haven't gone what's out. What's your any, alternative? There's, there's loads. Of, the most important and single most important thing, and Zach's already talked about it, is to use coal in a carbon neutral way. Because if we don't do it, that's it won't be done in the rest of the decades. Away well, and it'll double the price of electricity. Do you want this well, country to go bankrupt? Well, I don't want the country to go bankrupt, and I don't think it's decades away. Oh, yeah. it is, I promise you, Bernard, if it is decades away, all of the 60 million people in this country are going to have their prosperity and personal security undermined by climate change. So if it is 60 years away, we better get on with doing something, not spending as no, we are now no. £2.8 billion pounds this year on cleaning up the waste of. Uh, the nuclear industry and nothing on carbon sequestration and storage. That's, that's, that's a, billion, that's not... a billion pounds spent on wind power, which is totally intermittent, useless, and won't close a single uh, conventional power station. You know, stupidity. You, you, you hear this argument all the time about wind power being intermittent. Actually, demand is intermittent too, and because of that, we have to have 20% or more surplus capacity in our electricity system to cope with the fact that demand is intermittent. My only point is, we're used to coping with intermittency. We've been doing it for a very long time. There isn't any prospect of the is, I mean, out. this wind power is an alternative. We need a range of different types of electricity production. Uh, electricity is at different levels of demand at different times of the day, at different times of the year. You need different technologies technologies to be able to, uh, to cope with that. There are certain technologies that you cannot command. If, if electricity demand rises at five o'clock in the afternoon, you can't go to certain technologies and say, please produce more. You can't ask the wind to blow. So we need a range of things. And the big electricity companies, they know this, and some of them want to put very large sums into new nuclear power. They, they want a balanced Portfolio. So why haven't they done it? So let, they have let's not let Zach Goldsmith have a say. No, no, I, I was just going to say that I, with the exception of clean coal, which is some way off, every alternative is something, whether it's wind, whether it's solar, whether it's micro-generation, whether it's combined heat and power, every alternative can happen in a much, much shorter time frame. Netherlands went from have, producing virtually no power from combined heat and power to being, uh, having more than half of their energy generated through combined heat and power in less than a decade. Germany has one town, Freiburg, 200,000 homes, 200,000 people in fact, which produces more solar power than the whole of Britain. The climate doesn't explain it. It's a small reason, but it's not the reason. They have a framework. What do they do at night? Well, they, they've they store the energy that's generated by oh, solar, and that's yes. what supports yeah. them doing that. Yeah, the fact they is, they, rely have, upon, they, re, they rely upon nuclear power to uh, keep they, them going. They have a f massively growing, a mushrooming renewable energy sector. 220,000 people employed in it compared to 20,000 in this country. They're way ahead of the game. It's already, Netherlands, put, the, it's already put the lights out. Oh, it hasn't put the lights it, it, out. It, at the end of 2005, you know, you know the they only, had a problem with wind power. Well, when the east coast of America suffered this incredible grid failure, I, I forget how long ago, 12 months ago, I think, mm. the only places in the big cities which remained lit were the skyscrapers with their own combined heat and power decentralized energy systems. Everyone else was plunged into darkness. This Do you is at a, least accept the force <laughs> of the argument that if in climate change is the greatest <coughs> potential catastrophe facing us yeah. all, that nuclear power is if we can get it to work, it does meet that 
anxiety? Well, I, I think the, the claims, it is clearly a cleaner energy than, yeah. than coal as it is at the moment, for example. But I think it's wildly exaggerated. If we doubled nuclear capacity in this country, so we replace our existing reactors and double them, which no one really is talking about in this country, you're talking about at, at most an 8% reduction. In terms of value for money, you have to put your money into energy efficiency. We could achieve two-thirds energy savings in the average home in Britain through sky. retrofitting. I, now, I, I, well, I, I, pie in the sky, it's stuff in the it, attic, it, isn't it? it? It's, 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 it's responsible for trying to promote energy conservation in this country, and I did it for five years. And if you think it's easy, you have another thing coming. I think it's it is very, extremely I think, difficult. I think it's not only easy, it's very easy. It just You're simply requires yourself. a bit of government leadership. Totally Our proposal yourself. within the Conservative Party is to have big incentives when houses are, uh, are transferred at the point of sale, when no one's living in a home, and therefore there's no problems with disruption. If you create incentives which are big enough, you will see massive subsidies, energy efficiency. Subsidies. You're talking about tax yeah. discounts, You're stamp duty about rebates. Subsidies. You're, You're talking, talking about stamp duty rebates, which I suppose is a form well, of subsidy. national emergency, Bernard. Pardon? It is a national emergency, isn't it, climate change? Uh, I'm sorry, is it a national emergency? It, it, even if it's, uh, let's Why? put that argument to one side, what you still have, you emergency have energy is security is issues which are concerned con con to everyone. That is a national emergency. Just to, can, we, can we just yeah. be clear uh, where you're coming from, Zach Goldsmith? Is it now Conservative Party policy to be anti-nuclear? The Conservative Party has a position which it's had for a long time since I got involved, which is that if the market can genuinely support nuclear power, then there's a green light for nuclear so, power. Uh, from my point of view, uh, that, that means that no to nuclear power. That is not quite correct, no. uh, because it's not very long ago I was involved in a, a Conservative Party meeting. I was very pleased to be invited, and I was told at that time that nuclear power was the last resort. Now the policy seems to have changed, and it seems to be more on the lines that you've just described. But this is exactly the sort of political well, situation... According to you, there's no problem with that policy, because it all can be done by the market. It, it makes it jolly difficult for people to make investment decisions when the politics... They need some political can, stability. But no, but the, the stability. politics hasn't changed within the Conservative Party. It's been the same. My well, view is... It my view is that five minutes in the Conservative ha hasn't Party. Changed. Alan Duncan was on television recently, and he came four squares, apparently, behind the government. No, it's, it's, it's just not true that. You, the party has always said that nuclear... They are. Absolutely Jeremy, not true. You asked the Conservative a really party. important question just now, which was, oh, yeah. can this help with climate change? Yes. Which is the really important question. Yes. And whatever yeah. Bernard no, thinks, just, most it, of the world thinks that uh, this is a, a, a global emergency. Why Gore is the right why expression. Why aren't they doing much about and, it? Uh, if you look at what nuclear power can do, Zach has said what it can do nationally, not very much. Globally, we're building about one nuclear power station a year. Just to keep the same level of nuclear power as other stations come offline. We have to build 14 a year. Frankly, and as, as Susan pointed out in her film, there's no prospect that the, the supply chain for nuclear power stations, their reactor vessels and so on, can build 14 a year. So it can't help you. And just, can we change. just clear up, what the, for only a few a minute left, one final anxiety. Are nuclear power stations now safe? That was why they stopped in America, wasn't it, after Three Mile Island? No, oh, no, no, they stopped. Nuclear power stations well, let's not get into why they stopped. Let me just ask the question. Are, it. Yes, my mistake. I'm misinformed. It was, are they safe? Yeah, yeah, I have no problem about anybody no. running a, a nuclear power station as long as you supply the regulatory and the training of the skills to it. I yeah. think we've run, the people who've run the industry have run a very good industry. So it's not, for me, a question of running the power stations we've got in Britain safely, whether we can export that regulatory climate to China where they're building 40 reactors over the next 30 years or India, that remains to be seen. But certainly there's no reason why people should fear nuclear power stations on safety grounds in this country as long as we don't do what we're currently proposing to do, which is weaken the regulatory system that makes them so well managed. Think of oil and where do you think of? Saudi Arabia, Iran, possibly Texas, but the chances are Pennsylvania isn't the first place to leap to mind. But 150 years ago, a small Pennsylvania town is exactly where oil was first found. It was a breakthrough which ushered in a whole new age. Now that same Pennsylvania land has prospectors returning in droves for natural gas. Matthew Price has gone to the birthplace of America's energy industry to see the changes. Beneath the rolling hills of Pennsylvania, lies what some see as a solution to America's growing energy needs. A mile and a half down is the largest natural gas field in the entire United States. It can, they believe, help to break this country's dependence on foreign oil. And natural gas is our cleanest burning fossil fuel. 
It can be used in cars as a motor vehicle fuel. It can be used to generate electricity. It can be liquefied and used as jet aviation fuel. This could really, the natural gas that's being developed in this country at this point in time, could really actually get us to energy independence. Many here are just as optimistic. The gas industry is leasing land from local owners. There's good money to be made. But not everyone is happy. Stephanie Hallowich and her family are surrounded by natural gas wells. We have two young children. This is not the country rural life we'd imagined. We thought we were moving to the country. This is where we were going to raise our family and, and stay. And now we're surrounded by all this. And we, we have huge issues about their health. You know, it, it's a concern. We've bathed them in this water. They've drank it. I've cooked with it. They you know, want to be outside and play. And some days the smell so strong, I don't want them out here. The gas companies insist their drilling does not harm the environment. Scientists argue the process could be cleaned up. But for many, any environmental costs are outweighed by the economic benefits. Pennsylvania was the center of another energy boom 150 years ago today, the oil rush. Since then, the U.S. has become the world's biggest consumer of energy. A century and a half later, and this country desperately needs a new energy solution, and that's causing a growing political division between those who believe that the answer lies in the vast natural gas reserves in places like this, and those who feel that the country needs to move in an entirely new and different direction. At the University of Pittsburgh, they're looking into alternative sources of energy. Natural gas is cleaner than oil, but it still releases greenhouse gases. The most important thing is that we have to stop looking at the short term. Sure, we can find enough fuel for the next two years, five years, ten years. But what happens at that point when we haven't built up our renewable or alternative energy technologies? What are we going to do then? What are our options at that point? And you fear natural gas is diverting attention at the moment? I do. It's a good bridge technology, but it's not the end-all and be-all of energy generation. But many here do see natural gas as a realistic alternative source of fuel. This is not the green revolution some, including President Obama, once spoke of. But it is cheap, available, and it may be how America chooses, at least in the short term, to meet its energy needs. Matthew Price, BBC News, Pennsylvania. So how will the new age of oil play out and what are the pressures to find an alternative source of energy? Here to discuss it is Daniel Jurgen. He's the chairman of Cambridge Energy Research Associates and he's written about the future of oil in the current edition of Foreign Policy magazine. Thank you so much for coming in, Mr. Jurgen. I think it, we, we really can't overestimate, can we, the impact of that discovery in Pennsylvania 150 years ago. It really changed everything, not just yeah. for America, of course, and, for the and world. Th when they started out on it, people thought they were basically insane. They thought the notion of drilling for oil and using oil as a substitute for whale oil for lighting it was all a very crazy thing, and it worked. And, and the man who was there, the colonel, of course, yes. wasn't really a colonel no. and just happened to be there. Yeah, they gave him the name colonel, and he had a group of investors who actually, the, virtually the same day that they, this discovery worked, they sent him a letter saying, we're pulling the plug, we're out of money, we've given up hope, this is, this is foolishness. And you write about a new age of oil. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that the world has obviously changed. Uh, in a couple of really big ways. One, we see it, and we see it in this incredible volatility of oil prices going up and down. The way oil is not only a physical commodity that you gets refined into gasoline or petrol that you put in your car, but it's a financial instrument like a stock or a bond, and we get this volatility. The other thing is, of course, we're in a climate change era, policies on that, and there is, as we saw in that segment just now, this incredible emphasis on technological innovation all across the energy spectrum. We are going to run out of oil, right? I mean, it's going to happen. Well, but it's probably going to happen a lot longer in the future than generally people think. This notion that we're soon going to run out of oil is not really correct. But if resources are limited at some point, Remember what does we're talking 50 or limiting? Years. Yes. What does that mean for policies for government? For individuals, well, for, for I you and me, I what actually does it think mean? that actually the notion that we're going to run out was very strong last year, and I think that was part of the reason we saw $147.27. I think demand will will be declining before we 
quote, run out of resources. We probably have a very long plateau of resources. Of course, there's lots of political problems and issues in terms of development. But in the United States, we've already reached peak demand in terms of gasoline. Our gasoline's going to go down. The growth is, of course, China and India and those countries with massive populations. Daniel Jurgen, author of the epic Quest for Oil, Money and Power. Thank you very much. Thank you. The prize, I'm sorry.